Unmute. Um, hello, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you, Julie, Professor Chen, um, for that uh, kind introduction and for inviting me um, to participate in this event today. Um, it's always a pleasure to talk uh, about Taiwan to a knowledgeable and engaged and enthusiastic um, audience. Um, but look, as, as Julie has mentioned, um, when I agreed to do this talk three weeks ago, um, I, I couldn't guess, and I don't think anybody could have guessed how different the COVID um, situation uh, would be um, today than it was. Um, but that's how quickly things can change uh, with the virus, unfortunately. Um, and having endured the UK's nightmarish experience uh, with coronavirus for a year and a half, um, I completely empathize uh, with people in Taiwan, or if you've got family there uh, and are worried or are living there, I'm, I'm sending uh, in Qigong uh, style, I'm sending positive vibes to, to everybody in, uh, in Dragon Ball style. Uh, so um, here we are, uh, another WHA, uh, another year where Taiwan uh, is on the outside looking in. Um, even a raging global pandemic uh, is apparently insufficient reason uh, for Taiwan to secure an invite um, to this world health body. Um, indeed, uh, on Monday, the proposal um, to even put it on the agenda for discussion didn't make it out of general committee, uh, which I think is just a really regrettable situation um, all round. Um, for the last five years since, actually, I mean, a little bit longer than that, since before Taiwan was even inaugurated, uh, I've been speaking to Chinese officials about this, um, and their message uh, hasn't changed at all. And the message is, if Taiwan would just accept the fact of the uh, 1992 consensus, they could participate in the WHO just like that. Uh, it's Taiwan who has changed the status quo. Uh, <laughs> to which one might retort uh, that China doesn't accept the 1992 consensus either. Uh, and the WHO is supposed to be an institution serving global health uh, rather than, um, you know, getting into the intricacies of political disputes or serving a particular political preference. Um, but the fact is the Chinese position has not diverted um, from this argument that it's the DPP, it's the Taiwan uh, administration who are guilty of political manipulation, and are sacrificing the health of the Taiwanese people for political gain. Uh, so here we are again. Um, the politicization, I mean, Harry is the expert on this, but uh, let me tread on his toes for a second. Um, the politicization of this issue, of course, isn't new. Um, the ROC lost its membership of the WHO in 1972 after a year after losing its um, United Nations seat. Thereafter, the WHO continued to reject Taiwan's bid for membership. Um, from 2009, uh, Taiwan did attend the WHA uh, in uh, observer um, status and continued this practice throughout the, uh, the Mindjil um, tenure, uh, albeit required to secure China's agreement to do so um, every year. Um, this was one of the, uh, the tangible fruits of Ma's embrace of the 1992 consensus and his sincerity, uh, as the Chinese call it, uh, in adhering to the one China conceit. Um, there's a lot of politics to unpack here. We can return to that um, in the discussion later, um, if need be. Um, for the moment, I wanna take you back to um, 2003, um, because I think 2003 is a, a really uh, instructive comparison. So in 2003, Taiwan had a very rough, uh, but ultimately formative experience with SARS. Um, I was there at the time. Um, I can attest to just how scary it was, how little information there was, and the palpable sense of Taiwan's isolation. Um, unsurprisingly, due to that experience, um, WHO participation became a really, really salient political issue uh, in Taiwan thereafter. Um, Taiwan in 2003 was really not 
uh, extremely well placed in terms of its emergency response preparedness or its capacity. Um, public health communications um, were unsophisticated and they were generally subsumed by partisan and sensationalist media. Uh, and of course, at the time, Chen Shui-bian uh, was presiding over a deeply poli uh, polarized society um, with low levels of uh, public trust, uh, high levels of public dissatisfaction, uh, for which he was partly, uh, but not wholly, responsible. Fast forward to 2020, COVID-19, another DPP government in power, uh, and Taiwan again was, uh, of course, excluded from the WHO, um, but this time Taiwan was in a much stronger position. Um, the government responded rapidly to, to this, this news, uh, coming out of China of a mystery pneumonia uh, emerging in Wuhan uh, and implemented um, an exemplary response that led to the virus being contained uh, to a low case load, to few deaths and no time spent in lockdown. Um, and public support for the government's response and approval of the president uh, reached historically high levels. So, you know, how did they do it? I mean, after SARS, um, successive governments um, worked to improve their risk communication efforts. Uh, Taiwan CDC took a central role in communicating responses to uh, H1N1, avian flu, MERS outbreaks. Um, the Communicable uh, Disease Control Act was modified uh, to rein in the media, making them liable for rumor mongering and misinformation. Taiwan is routinely subject to PRC misinformation campaigns anyway, uh, and other forms of information warfare. So mechanisms were put in place uh, to monitor and respond to false information online. Government departments and the CDC used all manner of digital uh, communication methods and digital media for their messaging. Uh, the Central Epidemic Command Center established protocols for the isolation of patients with infectious diseases, uh, emergency response medical resources were centralized and a hierarchy of responsible national and regional uh, hospitals was established. Not only that, I mean, perhaps more impressively still, as a global leader in e-government, Taiwan put transparency at the center of public health uh, with vast open access data repositories made available through the CDC and government websites in multiple uh, languages used in Taiwan. Um, the Central Epidemic Command Center quickly implemented more than 100 different uh, actions, including border controls, isolation, screening, PPE uh, production, mass distribution, proactive case identification. Uh, the National Health Insurance uh, database was integrated for a time with immigration databases, to cross-reference travel histories and symptoms. Uh, obviously, this was at a time when thousands of Taiwanese business people were, were returning to Taiwan uh, from working in China. Um, unfortunately, uh, we over here um, didn't act on Taiwan's lead. Um, we, we didn't follow their guide in, instead of waiting three weeks for the WHO to accept the fact of human to human transmission. Um, and in the crucial period that allowed the virus to take hold in Europe and the US, uh, we simply didn't learn from Taiwan. Um, perhaps, um, I don't know, this is a question, perhaps it would have been different if Taiwan's voice had have been present in the WHO. Uh, the end result of all this action uh, for Taiwan was that its gold standard zero COVID response uh, was lauded globally um, and allowed Taiwan to become um, this oasis of normality, I, I think. Um, so while the world uh, was losing three to four million lives um, and faced economic devastation and endured huge social disruptions that are still ravaging many countries, Taiwan's economy grew more than 3% um, last year. Uh, and Taiwanese people did not face major disruptions to everyday life. Um, I remember uh, last spring, while New York and Italy were suffering their catastrophic outbreaks, um, pro baseball players in Taiwan were carrying on playing. Um, this spring, as we were 
uh, still in the midst of our third national lockdown. Uh, 70,000 uh, pilgrims uh, joined the Mazu uh, uh, pilgrimage in Taiwan. Um, and throughout all the many dark days of 150,000 deaths in the UK, my social media has been full of uh, images of people in Taiwan um, following their lives unimpeded, um, you know, like they're on a different planet, not just a different continent. So Taiwan's pandemic narrative, uh, as Judy mentioned, has of course changed, at least for now. Um, in the last two weeks alone, it's added 3,000 cases, uh, a small number of fatalities um, that nevertheless represent about three quarters of the total uh, number since the beginning. <coughs> Um, in comparative perspective, Taiwan's outbreak is on a very small scale, um, but it represents the last major population center in the world to experience community spread. Uh, and unsurprisingly, uh, people in Taiwan are, <coughs> excuse me, uh, people in Taiwan are, are anxious, they're agitated, and uh, some of them are angry. Um, after maintaining vigilance for such a long period of time, um, the outbreak itself was um, a, a result of fatigue, of complacency, of some policy missteps uh, and uh, human fallibility. Um, having relied on controlling the borders and keeping uh, imported infections out, uh, the virus managed to get through a small gap in the protocols uh, through airline staff uh, subject to looser quarantine conditions. Um, Taiwan, to a certain extent, I think, has been a victim of their own success. Um, because the caseload was so low, uh, the government kind of took its eye off the ball when it came to mass testing, for example. Um, and because hospitalizations and deaths were kept so low, um, there really was um, no urgency to, to secure or to rapidly develop uh, a vaccine program. So unlike the US and the UK, um, where our only hope to get the coronavirus under control was through vaccine, uh, Taiwan didn't have the same kind of incentive structure. Um, currently, I don't think there's a concrete schedule for mass vaccination, uh, although uh, a, a native vaccine, I think, is projected by summer. Um, I know that 400,000 doses were, were just delivered this week, um, but acquisition of enough vaccines um, has, has been subject to confusion and, and some politics. Um, from what I've uh, read in the Taiwanese media and some, um, some opinion polls, there seems to be um, quite a widespread attitude of vaccine snobbery. Um, and extremely low levels of reported willingness um, to get vaccinated, um, which might be a problem down the line. Um, some of this is related to low trust, um, but I think it's also symptomatic of a failure to keep pace with the way that uh, the pandemic has evolved. Um, so it's no longer the same coronavirus as it was. Um, the UK variant, um, which is the one that's creating, creating problems in Taiwan right now, uh, is more transmissible than the original. The Indian variant, which has just become uh, the dominant strain uh, in the UK, is even more uh, transmissible. Uh, and both are spread uh, asymptomatically, um, something which uh, Taiwan's reduced attention to mass testing um, obviously doesn't help with. So in the first phase of the, the pandemic, border controls, masking, social distancing um, were fundamental to Taiwan's success, um, but they're not sustainable indefinitely as has been shown. So the road to normality for um, pretty much everybody, uh, rather than quasi normality, is through mass vaccination. Uh, and on that, Taiwan is currently underperforming. Um, that Taiwan is dealing with this current outbreak at the same time uh, that it's dealing with a drought which has emptied the reservoirs and inconsistent electricity supply uh, is a real challenge um, for the Thai government. Uh, and with Taiwan currently, uh, or Taipei at least, currently in level three soft lockdown, 
companies uh, are dealing with work from home for the first time, schools are doing online study for the first time, uh, and Taiwan's pandemic experience um, is starting to look a bit more familiar. Um, so let me now um, uh, broaden out and speak to um, three dimensions of the international politics uh, in which Taiwan's pandemic year uh, is situated. Um, again, I think that 2003 is uh, a good year to keep in mind as a comparator. So in 2003, um, and, and, and through most of his uh, tenure, in fact, um, outside of Taiwan, Chen Shui-bie was uniformly painted as an irresponsible uh, adventurer, um, risking peace in Taiwan Strait through his pursuit of uh, Taiwanese nationalism and uh, Taiwan independence. The fact is Chen didn't say anything uh, that Tsai and uh, her government officials kind of say on a routine basis nowadays. Um, Taiwan in 2003 was not lauded as an exemplar of democracy, um, nor did it receive um, international support for its attempts to join international organizations like it has now. Um, suddenly in 2003, uh, the United States was not saying things like, um, Taiwan is a, a reliable partner, a vibrant democracy and a force for good in the world. Uh, and hence should uh, be allowed to join uh, the WHA as it did last week. Uh, but then um, the world in 2021 is not the same uh, place as it was in 2003. Um, since 2016, since the Thai government came in, um, the PRC has been incrementally, gradually increasing pressure on Taiwan, um, slowly but surely. Um, with still a lot of room left for escalation and a very diverse repertoire uh, of things that it can do. Um, over the course of the pandemic year, um, maybe as an attempt to deflect uh, from the narrative about China being the origin of the virus or to take advantage of others' um, preoccupation uh, with handling it, um, there's been a, a very uh, tangible escalation of incursions by the um, PLA Air Force um, into Taiwan's ADIZ, uh, missile exercises conducted, sail throughs uh, and cyber attacks to go with uh, a continuing full court press on Taiwan's international space, uh, courting ROC allies with medical diplomacy and vaccine diplomacy, um, plus the usual bellicose rhetoric uh, and a systematic disinformation campaign um, that was designed to uh, undermine confidence in the Thai government's handling of the pandemic, um, which predictably uh, has ramped up in the last couple of weeks. So at base, um, you know, the thing behind this, I mean, Xi Jinping's consolidation of supreme power um, and specification of unification as the missing piece uh, for rejuvenation of the great Chinese nation um, means that the buck stops with him. Um, Chinese nationalism as the overarching framework for CCP legitimacy um, is a hard master and it requires movement on the Taiwan issue. Uh, unfortunately, for, from the PRC perspective, uh, the trends in Taiwan in both elite politics and in public opinion, national identity, future national status uh, preferences uh, over the last 20 years have developed almost monotonically in the wrong direction for the PRC. Um, despite all the noise of politics in Taiwan, there is a broad consensus that um, the status quo equals existing Taiwanese functional autonomy, that Taiwan is a discrete entity uh, that is distinguished by being not China, uh, and that Taiwanese governments should preserve the reality of this de facto independence. Um, so the PRC itself frames this as Taiwan independence and attributes it erroneously solely to the DPP. Uh, which is a big mistake in my opinion. 
um, and their frustration at seeing Taiwan uh, being lauded for uh, its, its gold standard COVID response under a DPP government um, is pretty obvious to see. Um, the long-term reframing of independence to fit within the status quo ROC framework, um, an increasing international recognition um, that the physical world realities in Taiwan support this view, uh, has really consolidated the notion in Beijing um, that the Taiwan issue is further than ever from being resolved. Uh, and as a result, cross-strait relations are frozen, they're deteriorating, and they're increasingly at risk of escalation. Um, this is all happening at a time when um, globally there is a change uh, with regard to opinion uh, about the PRC. Um, among political elites and publics um, in the advanced economy, liberal democracies uh, conveniently known as the West. Um, interactions with, with China are intensifying in a lot of these countries and, you know, whether it's trade, uh, technology, uh, hurt feelings, sanctioning behaviors, border disputes, uh, territorial claims, overfishing, uh, propaganda efforts, or these hectoring uh, wolf warrior uh, uh, diplomats. Um, they've all alerted countries to the difficult realities uh, of dealing with a rising superpower with an ever greater determination to, to press its own interests. Uh, and so as a result, India, Australia, Canada, various EU nations, the, the UK, uh, and numerous others um, have come to experience Chinese pressures and influence activities. The US itself is experiencing a, a, an acute awakening at the moment as to the nature of its strategic rivalry uh, with China. Uh, and this all makes Taiwan's long experience dealing with the PRC much more salient uh, and much easier to uh, empathize with uh, especially as a fellow liberal um, democracy. Um, because, I mean, globally democratic uh, values are under threat uh, from without, uh, from alternative political systems, but also from within, as we, we need to recognize. Um, but the perception of a values-based bifurcation uh, of the world is becoming more common. Um, and on the Chinese side, the, the systematic repression of Uyghur people in Xinjiang, uh, the dismantling of um, you know, the, the fundamentals of one country, two systems in Hong Kong, um, and the generalized circumscription of freedoms uh, in China under Xi Jinping uh, have made it easy to, um, to frame China as one side of this equation. Um, now, there's obviously a politically instrumental um, aspect to this. And it's kind of awkward that um, many of Taiwan's biggest supporters just happen to be right-wing politicians with an obvious antipathy uh, towards China. Um, but nonetheless, you know, the, the relevant point for Taiwan is um, that it's positioning as a member of the, uh, the global community of liberal democracies, which is a deliberate framing strategy uh, on, on the part of the Thai government uh, is starting to resonate much more strongly. Um, certainly in the US, Taiwan uh, enjoys widespread and, and really surprisingly bipartisan support, um, you know, as, as evidenced by uh, the number of initiatives taken by Trump, uh, which Biden hasn't touched yet. Um, in fact, the Biden administration has, has not done anything um, to suggest that it's going to launch a reset um, in US-China relations, um, which, which continue to be in a really bad way. Um, the fact that Taiwan and its handling of uh, the coronavirus um, didn't sacrifice its values um, and in fact marshaled um, civil society resources and did this with great transparency, um, I think is an, a really important coda uh, to its positioning as a democracy. 
Um, and, you know, the other thing that's different from 2003 is that all of this action, all of this stuff that's been going on, um, has been documented extensively by a large number of foreign correspondents um, who were expelled or denied visas uh, or had their working conditions made intolerable uh, in China and therefore relocated um, to Taipei. So all of these things I've mentioned here, um, they coalesce in the discussion around Taiwan's participation in the, the, the WHO. So Taiwan's response in reducing the spread and staying COVID free for so long um, demonstrated that Taiwan has the knowledge and the skills and the preparedness uh, from which global health as represented supposedly by the WHO uh, could benefit. Um, Taiwan's use of its industrial capacity um, to ramp up PPE and medical supply production uh, and then donating this equipment at the height of the first wave uh, showed that, you know, as the hashtag says, uh, Taiwan can help. Um, and of course, you know, Taiwan's um, capacity to contribute its world-class medical expertise um, would obviously be enhanced to the benefit of everybody uh, if it were allowed access uh, and hence the, the more poignant um, hashtag, let Taiwan help. So I think, you know, beyond doubt, um, the coronavirus pandemic um, has shown how interconnected um, global health issues are and no population should be denied the um, you know, the benefits of access to the world's main body for coordinating on global on public health. Um, going forward for Taiwan, this will be even more important if the WHO reforms uh, and, and establishes a global health threats council uh, with beefed up institutions and funding and rules. Um, but, but Taiwan's exclusion, um, I think, is one of, of many examples where uh, Chinese efforts to, um, to marginalize and curtail Taiwan's international space have been facilitated by establishing influence in multilateral organizations uh, and mobilizing support from the developing world and uh, non-democracies. Uh, and the realization in many countries that what they are starting to encounter in their relationships with China uh, is what Taiwan has been facing for a long time, uh, has opened a lot of eyes to the inequity of treatment of Taiwan. Uh, and finally, after years and years and years uh, of silence, um, they're starting to speak up. Um, so in the past three weeks, the G7, the United States, uh, the French Senate, uh, and many individual um, parliamentarians from many different countries uh, have all gone on record um, to call for Taiwan's participation. Um, Taiwan has a, a major appeal, um, which is that, you know, a, as a major global economy, a major tech power, uh, a fully fledged uh, liberal democracy with liberal, democ with liberal values, uh, being barred from the WHO, et cetera, is simply incongruous uh, and incommensurate with Taiwan's status. Uh, and I think as the dividing line between uh, democratic and authoritarian values becomes more pronounced, uh, this incongruity uh, is, um, is, is increasingly obvious. Uh, and so to wrap up, um, you know, the, the title um, of this talk was All Eyes Are On Taiwan. Um, all eyes are on Taiwan um, for good and, and less good reasons. Um, for its initial superior COVID response, for its current difficulties, um, for its experience of, of, de of handling the PRC, um, for its demonstration of commitment to democratic values in facing both uh, COVID and pressures from the PRC, um, for the pressures on its freedoms, for the incongruousness of its lack of international space, um, and for the precarity uh, of its functional autonomy. Uh, Taiwan is uh, you know, uh, is attracting a lot of attention um, right now. Uh, and on that note, I will uh, wrap up uh, my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan.
for um, presenting a very comprehensive overview of Taiwan's situation domestically and internationally. And uh, we can further discuss later, but I think now uh, I would like to give the floor to Harry Wu. Harry, are you ready? Would you like to share screen? Yes, thank you, Julie. Okay, so first of all, I would like really uh, to, to thank uh, Professor Julie Chen for inviting me uh, to share my thoughts on uh, this topic, Taiwan's participation in the WHO. And actually, uh, I am going to write on uh, Jonathan just now's presentation on Taiwan can help and actually uh, to comment on what actually Taiwan uh, did help with this in, the, in its early years uh, uh, participation in the WHO. And uh, so uh, Jonathan has already given a microscopic view uh, about the, uh, all the politics in, in, in recent years, but I'm going to take you back, further back to uh, pre-1972 uh, or even further back to um, the early, uh, early post-war period. Right. So this is actually uh, a, a screen cap from uh, Johns Hopkins table of uh, the cases numbers in early and in, at the very beginning of the pandemic, Taiwan was described as Taipei and the environments. And this is actually a very strange name. And it got, uh, it, it got changed to Taiwan after people protested, right? Roughly the same time um, last year, at this time that the, uh, this is uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs tweet uh, to, to show people that Taiwan can help by sending uh, PPEs, predominantly face masks, to uh, Taiwan's political allies, right? And then, but actually, that that move uh, did not really ca uh, well, catch much attention by the world. So this this was a famous uh, Taiwan can help campaign, and this was yesterday that Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen's Twitter that also tweeted that Taiwan could not be ex excluded from the World Health Assembly, but actually, well, it actually did not really uh, catch enough attention either. Right? So historically, Taiwan's participation in the WHO, according to this first director general, Brad Chishong, that he said that Taiwan's representing the seat of China, actually it's, 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 it represented the entire China pre-1972 was an absurdity which is outstanding even in the era of absurdities. But we need to pay attention that uh, before 1972, the entire China was excluded. So when uh, China was suffering from the very rampant epidemic of cholera, typhus, and malaria as well, and then that country was excluded. So, uh, this is uh, the modern public health concept kind of emerged at the beginning of the 20th century and clearly that its vision on every individual in the community to be covered, to be ensured that, and this was actually contested. So there was always con um, uh, uh, con conflicts between the global vision of health governance and also when it comes to intervention at local level. Right, it, 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 it is always illusory. Right? What are the illusions then? This is um, something that I'm going to emphasize um, in today's presentation, just three points. First of all, WHO historically kind of envisaged, envisaged a homogeneous world. Second illusion was that it has always been obsessing with technical approaches. That means very simple method to solve public health problems by saving energies by spending the least of amount of money and trying to really achieve the maximum benefit to de de deliver the best to the world and can be free from politics. And another less uh, attended kind of illusion was from the perspective of developing country, which was an impractical dreamscape imagined by, by developing countries. Right. Now, this is actually the history of pandemics. Now from ancient time to, present, uh, to the present time. So uh, we see that in the, 19th, uh, in the 20th century, actually we had uh, several droves of flus, 
from 1918, Spanish flu, people started, uh, began to get familiarized with this pandemic. Uh, only, not, 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 not really familiar with this until nowadays, right? And then 1950s, there, were, there was Asian flu. In 1968, there was Hong Kong flu. And look at the na name, Asian flu, Hong Kong flu. No one talked about the, no one tried really to politicize the name of the flu until nowadays, COVID-19 originated from Wuhan. People, uh, there was a campaign not to really name um, the, uh, the, the virus related disease with the name Wuhan. Okay, the origins of global medicine, medicine roughly that the idea came up uh, from the la uh, latter half of the 19th century along industrial revolution and along the emergence and popularization of the concept of sanitation. With, uh, and these are all bound with, uh, for example, like opium, labor trade and other commodity trade during uh, the, the, the long 19th century. And then the institutionalization of global health, actually global, in the name of global medicine, international, actually international health was this, was in the, uh, the last decade of the 19th century, the uh, international san sanitary con convention. Right. And then we can see something interesting. So along the past century, we saw the increase of international health organizations. It's not only World Health Organizations. And we can see on this image on the right, you can see that after the Second World War, there was a watershed. The numbers of uh, international health organization, organizations started to surge, right? And the emergence of these organizations was to first encourage international health cooperation to simplify and ac accelerate exchange of epidemiological information between states, to secure and revise international agreements, and to cooperate among themselves, right? So to ensure the maximum benefit in terms of health of all mankind, right? WHO was one of them. When it was uh, established in 1948, I mean, the institution was written two years before the establishment. Health was a state of complete physical, mental, social well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmary, in infirmity. This was a very grandiose kind of vision, the ethos. But since its establishment, uh, establishment, establishment that it had been always suffering from lack of money, lack of staff, lack of research method. Right? So its operation modality relied on two very important uh, elements. First is de uh, decentralization to prevent itself from becoming authoritarian power, right? And then to really rely on the expertise of developing com uh, countries. And then so it, what it, it attempted to remain instrumental only, right? This was its own vision. So the whole world was then categorized into six different uh, regional offices. And then Taiwan belonged to the West Pacific Regional Office. And this is a, another thing that, uh, that, uh, that we need to pay attention to, which was the strategy kind of taken by the World Health Organization, which was outsourcing and techno, techno, uh, technical approach just now we mentioned. Outsourcing was important because, well, it kind of uh, has always suffered from the short, shortage of manpower. But so they, they really rely, need to rely on external uh, impacts, influences. And because over the first uh, 10 years of its existence, it had or grown to become a large bureaucracy. So actually in order to mobilize things going uh, that, that are going on in the institution, outsourcing will become very important. But let's look at, look at uh, WHO's early effort. And one of the most important early projects conducted by the WHO was malaria eradication program. And this was something Taiwan was also proud of because it was part of the project. And then uh, let's forget about the, whole, the details of the project, but actually roughly this is a, a campaign of DTT's brain. DTT is a kind of uh, pesticide that can kill the vectors of uh, the, the pathogen of malaria. 
So by spraying DDT on the surface of, of household, using the remaining uh, the poison on the household surfaces that you can kill the vector of malaria. And this is a very simple and typical technical approach. Right? I will let you watch uh, a video and it's a silent. as he comes ashore. All this time, other ships are evacuating troops from the Tatians, leaving the deserted islands to the invading communists. Anything destroyable has been destroyed. The homes the people left, the shops and office buildings, even the crops in the fields. To the southwest in the Formosa Straits lies nationalist-held Kemoi. Okay, so this was uh, a footage made by British Pate and then all their archives can be found on YouTube. If you are, if you are interested, if you just Google. British Pate, Taiwan, or Formosa, that you can really find a lot of footage, and this is one of them, right? Actually, malaria eradication program was a failure, right? Why, was it, why did it fail? Because, first of all, it, re it relied too much on so-called the technical approach, and it didn't really consider so-called the uh, very uh, massive scale planning, you know, the administrative problems, financial constraints, operational setbacks, uh, the problem of training, and also cultural resistance. And then uh, it, it over-relied on, or well, actually it was overly idealistic to avoid politics. It actually avoided, avoided entire China, right? Did not include entire China. And then in India was an area that, is, that was so big that it, uh, people actually did not really want them to come into the household and spray the, the so-called sacred corner in the households. So actually this kind of technical approach did not consider cultural aspects. And all, the, for example, that Africa was exclu excluded. So, uh, and then there was some uh, part of Africa was still uh, under colonial rules. And nowadays, Sub-Saharan Africa was still the most epidemic uh, malarial area. And then in 1968, uh, the WHO changed the name of the program to Malaria Control, very secretly, actually quite sneakily. Right? So actually the WHO did not really recognize its own failure, but historically we know that it's not a successful campaign. But, WHO used, for example, used Taiwan to, to as, as a propaganda. For example, in their uh, official document, they said, Taiwanese people said, thank you. Like this image on the right, these uh, Aboriginal people, they were carrying DDTs, uh, actually the, the pesticides used in the malarial campaign, anti-malarial campaign. And let, let's look at the WHO's model students in this campaign. They were all, we can't say that they were underdeveloped countries. At least they were developing countries. They were previously uh, colonies of different empires. And then these uh, different islands, they were used as laboratories for this kind of campaign. And there were all small islands. Taiwan was one of them. And then by the nightmares of WHO, was these large areas countries with the problem of poverty, with cultural gaps, with very turmoil political conditions, right? This was published in 2005 by the Ministry of Health in Taiwan. So uh, the Minister of uh, Health at that time was uh, Zhang Poya, Dr. Zhang Poya. And she actually said that Taiwan has to really maintain the zero malaria status until until that malaria was eradicated uh, uh, in the world. And this implies that uh, Taiwan's case was an example for the WHO to learn from. And during the years long, decades long Taiwan's campaign to re-enter the WHO, this example was extensive, extensively cited. Right? But actually WHO had already changed its tone to malaria control. WHO did not really need to take care or uh, pay any attention to this successful story because the narrative ha has already changed.
right? Not only infectious disease, or mental health as well. This is uh, my book that just, just now published in April. I talked about a story uh, about WHO's effort to understand uh, mental disorders worldwide and use the evidence to classify mental disorders that can be used by psychiatrists worldwide. But then I don't want to go into the detail of this uh, story. I just want to cite the, the contingencies the project relied on really to facilitate the program. And then the, why did a Taiwanese psychiatrist, and he was chosen by the WHO to become the medical officer overseeing the project. There were two medical uh, coincidences, right? Okay, oh, let's omit this slide. There are some uh, contingencies. Uh, let me look at how much time I have. I perhaps can, yeah, I think I can skip all these five contingencies. I can come back to these uh, later, right? So it was like a, talk, uh, like a convenience of marriage. Right? No, I mean ma marriage of convenience uh, for the, the rend uh, rendezvous between the WHO and Taiwan. There were too many coincidences for uh, the WHO and Taiwan to be uh, to be working together, right? If you are interested, it I'm uh, I, I can come back to these contingencies later. So the project actually uh, there were some achievements. So the project actually resulted in uh, the internet uh, some promise. These psychiatrists in the WHO, at, as a result, they believe that international collaboration is possible. I mean, between the WHO and a typical developing country, which was China, and China at that time was Taiwan. And then it actually successfully wrote, uh, established a universal profile of one mental disorder. And then it successfully rewrote the classification of mental disorders, which was the chapter five of ICD is International Classification of Diseases, if you are not familiar with, right? And then it provided golden standard for underdeveloped countries for mental health research. Now, they were also discontent. I'm not going to dwell on this. This is something that I'm going to, uh, I want to emphasize is while the WHO was thinking about that they had to rely on uh, the strategy of outsourcing to learn from the expertise from developing countries. From the side of developing countries, they actually envisage, envisage, uh, envisage themselves as a modern state that can be equivalent with Western countries as well. So this is by, uh, in terms of STS, science and technology studies, this is a kind of mentality of dreams, dreamscape. By developing uh, the, uh, this social technological imageries, they imagine themselves that uh, they, by modernizing themselves, I mean, these developing countries, they think that they are also the same as the US, the UK, and some European countries, right? But by modernizing these uh, 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 certain programs in, in these countries, East Asian countries, for example, that did not, they did not really uh, pay attention to the social, cultural, political expert aspects of modernization. So in my book, I, 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 I talk about a lot of, uh, a few psychiatrists eventually after the uh, Taiwan successfully participated in the program and helping to rewrite the classification of mental diseases. There were psychiatrists asking whether Taiwan should develop its own diagnostic system. And there were psychiatrists asking whether Taiwan has become an expert export processing zone of international standards, right? So there are a lot of prob uh, prob problems the WHO now is actually facing, which is first of all, the new uh, utopianism, the international, the scientific internationalism, it was caught up constantly between the international scientific, uh, scientific internationalism and also the Cold War politics. So it constantly faced that members pulling out and joining the organizations. 
and it cannot really, the programs cannot really reach out to those split countries or non-states. And then there are always conflicts uh, between the WHO's policy and the state policies. And the WHO's recommenda recommendation cannot override the state power. We can see a lot of examples from the COVID experience. And then also we can see the disease control and techn technical intervention cannot really reflect on uh, well, uh, the, how much the health and welfare condition of a country that has been, uh, uh, I, I mean, uh, so, so I mean, so how well a disease is controlled in one state does not, does not really represent how well, how, how well the welfare program or health condition in that country. So WHO has really need to revise its uh, slogan every other 10 years. And then we can see a lot of examples. If you're interested in, there are many historical accounts of WHO that was already published last year. And then now, but actually WHO has grown to become so, such a large bureaucracy. Actually, some people can make, make differences, individuals. For example, like the director general, sorry. My phone just rang. Right. So it's quite interesting that the last director general, according to Larry Augustine, the scholar of uh, international public health law, that he commented on uh, Dr. Margaret Chan saying that her heart is in the right place, but she has stumbled and stumbled badly at times. And that was particularly about her response to Ebola. Right. And prior to her, there was this, uh, Dr. Gro Harlan Brundtland from Norway that she actually managed to contain SARS in 2003. And at that time, it's quite interesting. There was no such a thing called fake. So she did not really need to announce the, condition, uh, the emergency, but she was still able to use her own personal charisma and then to order uh, to stop the flights, uh, international flights, and then uh, eventually managed, managed to contain SARS virus worldwide. There were also new hopes. There are different examples. I'm not going to uh, recite all of them. And also, domain, uh, I mean, in a more mic mic microscopic level, for example, both Taiwan and China had been competing to win the hearts of their African allies, right? And this is something that uh, people are not really paying attention to. Now, Taiwan is suffering from its first surge of COVID-19 and China is offering its state uh, produced COVID vaccine to Taiwan. So clearly this is not humanitarianism. This is uh, part of the wolf, uh, uh, warrior wolf style uh, di diplomacy. New visions of, that, that, uh, of the WHO. People have been all, uh, aware that WHO is not operating in a homogeneous world is operating in a divided and complex world. And it has changed its, its uh, strategy, its principle from technical approach to partnership with NGO, with, uh, with uh, charities. And then, so the uh, impractical dreamscape from the perspective of developing countries has now been changed to practical dreamscape co-imagined by developed and uh, developing countries. If you're interested, I can, uh, I can, I can say, so, say more about these details, but let me close my presentation. Right, so this is uh, uh, something from our source, uh, uh, from, from my historical reflection. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. So would you, would you like to stop the sharing of screen? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing us with this historical development that um, perhaps most of our audience are not aware of. So that was very useful. Uh, I learned a lot from you. And um, now I think it's time for our Q&A sessions. And what I will do is that actually we have two experts here with us who will first make comments on the presentations. The first uh, discussion is Dr. Niklas uh, Schwangstrom. 
He's a director of the Institute for Security and Development Policy and one of its founders based in Sweden. And um, Niklas is also a fellow at the Foreign Policy Institute of the Paul H. Needs School of Advanced International Studies and also the Institute's um, Senior Associate Research Fellow. His main area of expertise are conflict uh, prevention, conflict management, international uh, security, particularly focusing in Northeast Asia. So I assume that perhaps Nicholas will come in more on the political side of the, today's uh, topic. While our second discussant, Jessica, she has a more mixed kind of background. I'm not so sure uh, if she's going to focus more on history, but Jessica is in fact my colleague uh, at the Department of Cultures in University of Helsinki. And she works in a number of interdisciplinary areas uh, crossing Chinese studies, international relations and history. She was a Shevening Fellow at University of Oxford and also the MOFA Taiwan Fellow at National Taiwan Normal University, has worked as a consultant for a number of uh, organizations in East Asia. So anyway, I'm not restricting, you know, um, which direction you want to come and perhaps we start with Niklaus, some comments, we collect them and then, uh, then I collect from Jessica and then our two speakers can select those questions that you feel you can uh, immediately respond. Yeah. So Niklas, please. <laughs> well, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, thanks for two excellent presentations, very enlightening and uh, well, as you said, maybe not from my perspective, but I think they reinforce very much uh, what I deal with and, and what I look at. And, and one of the things I, I, I come into, and I, I, I think when it comes to this pandemic, I, I think, and I know um, Dusisha is also looking at the same thing, thinking about the same thing, is disinformation or what the Taiwanese government has been talking about, cognitive warfare. And this is something we've seen very much in when it comes to the pandemic. I mean, Australia is one example who was uh, who wanted to uh, question the uh, the pandemic a bit, and China reacted extremely harsh on Australia. Uh, and Jonathan mentioned that it was a low, well, it was a low level of willingness to. Uh, get vaccination. I think I've read it was 40% of the Taiwanese population, which is extremely low for a well-educated country. I've, well, some other well-educated countries also has very low, I guess. But um, And also there was um, what they call the uh, vaccine snobbery. But what I want to sort of understand a bit better is, is this part of this disinformation campaign? Because um, I think what we see definitely in Europe is a very aggressive campaign, both from China and Russia, in trying to portray, especially Astra, but Western uh, vaccines in general, as insecure, bad, and the governments uh, in Europe has, and the United States have utterly failed and everything. So I want to see how, you know, ask the, the speakers really, how has the vaccine come up in the disinformation campaigns? Um, I mean, when you read Chinese media today, I mean, it, it's almost like Taiwanese people are dying in, in heaps and droves on the streets in Taiwan, which is not the case. I think the last I heard was 29 deaths. I, I'm sure it's higher today, but maybe a bit over 30, but um, how has the Chinese government used this? And have they, have they been successful? Because I do think the, uh, I think both the Russians and the Chinese have been rather successful in Europe. Um, and then I, I guess another question I have, and I, everything is politics. Far, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> um, and uh, so is um, medical. Unfortunately, international medical care. WHO, how much of a Chinese lapdog has that become? To put it bluntly, I'm using, in a sense, Chinese terminology here about um, other organizations. But what we see is that. 
Taiwan was allowed to be a part, and I think that has been ex exemplified very well, of WHO for, for quite some time. But this time, it was not even discussed if they should belong. So the question of Taiwan was killed before it even came to discussion. So for my part is how much has this been politicized and what should Taiwan do and what should the international community do? Because I, I'm of the strong opinion, it's rather unimportant if Taiwan is a country or not. Um, it's extre extremely important to get all areas globally on, on the track of the World Health Organization. I mean, health is a global phenomena and it shouldn't be politicized, but what can we do to bring that in? And I, I understand this is extremely difficult and I'm not very optimistic, uh, but I would really, I mean, Harry of course has been looking at this quite a lot and I would like to see if are there other ways to deal with this. Um, could it be coalitions of willing of the willing that would assist Taiwan uh, and also maybe to cooperate with Taiwan internationally? So I, I have sort of two questions there. And then I'm actually, today we, we see in the media about the Taiwanese failure of the COVID-19. Well, I think we have to be very... <laughs> So I think that's an unfair treatment because uh, uh, depiction of, of Taiwan. Nevertheless, I mean, let's be honest, Taiwan has been extreme, extremely successful up to now. And even if I think at the last figure I saw, they had 1.2 persons per 100,000 who was, COVID uh, was sick of COVID-19. I think the global average is a bit over eight. So, I mean, still Taipei and Taiwan is very successful. Um, so when you read media and especially the propaganda, you get the impression that Taiwan has utterly failed. But I, I still think Taiwan has been very successful. Of course, they haven't been able to stop it. And I think the vaccination is a big problem. But nevertheless, I, I, I do think that Taiwan should have a, you know, uh, recognition that has been successful up to now. And I think that they've done what they can do. And then I, I do agree with both uh, Jonathan and, and, and I think Harry in the sense that they relaxed too early and it, they thought, but nevertheless, um, they're still very much under the global average. And with a bit of vaccination campaigns, with a bit of international assistance, I think Taiwan could be managed quite successfully. And then oh, actually, let's be honest, when it comes to vaccine diplomacy, I would not use the Chinese vaccine either. I mean, I'm, and this is not snobbery, I'll take any vaccine. I would even consider uh, Sputnik, the Russian vaccine, but um, the Chinese vaccine, they, we know too little about it. Um, to be uh, to take it, and I don't think that necessary snobbery. I don't think Jonathan meant that either. But uh, um, I think we we do want vaccines that are secure, that have gone through international uh, evaluations or research processes, and I I wouldn't feel secure myself with the Chinese vaccine. And I'll hand over to Jessica, and um, we'll stop there. Hello. Yes, yes. So uh, first, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this event. I think that we should talk much, much more about Taiwan, uh, not only when it comes to uh, its reaction to COVID, for which I think that uh, taken the conditions in which Taiwan is operating internationally is more than success. So whatever happens in Taiwan, I think that the way that they are managing the situations from where they are should be uh, really uh, emphasized and uh, praised and uh, above all supported in whatever ways we can. So uh, I will in a way uh, just build on uh, Nicholas' uh, remarks and questions. I have similar concerns, uh, sometimes uh, not similar interpretations, but uh, I will 
try to pose the questions uh, to our speakers, both to Hari and to Jonathan. So thank you both very much uh, for your uh, in introductions of your research and your views today, uh, especially to Hari. I have to admit I am a historian deep, deep, deep in my soul. So uh, I really uh, appreciate this uh, long term observations of uh, uh, where we are at the moment, because this is not the situation that started in 2019. And uh, we can clearly see that uh, it is it is primarily uh, possible to connect this to the current political situation, but uh, fortunately or unfortunately, the roots of uh, all our questions and dilemmas are in the past. It would be much simpler if the problem uh, started like three years ago and with the Tsai regime and uh, we would know what to do. This, is, this goes deeper, this goes in much more complicated ways. So thank you very much for your historical overview of, of, of the issue. So. Uh, I will, I will first pose a question to both of you and then uh, one question for Jonathan and one question for Harry. So uh, the question for both of you, vaccines. So uh, I think that I totally agree uh, with what Nicholas said that uh, this is uh, vaccine diplomacy, that this is highly politicized issue. And uh, I would really appreciate to hear from both of you uh, two aspects of uh, the vaccines. So the first one is how do you observe the whole politicization of the obtaining the vaccines? So we know that uh, it is uh, not easy to get the vaccine now. It's maybe getting a little bit easier with uh, Pfizer and uh, with, uh, uh, let's say, normalization of production of the vaccines. But at some point it was uh, really almost impossible to get the vaccines. So uh, what Nicola said uh, about the Chinese vaccines, I can say uh, from what we know, and I always emphasize what we know about Central and Eastern Europe, it was not really the choice. So uh, there was this moment when you could not choose like the, the, the Western companies or something that the, the media and the politicians in Central and Eastern Europe would call uh, the Western, Western vaccines would be closed. There, there was a huge uh, silence about the lack of transparency about how do you get the vaccines from the position of edges of the European Union or uh, in front of the, the, the countries which are uh, boundaries of the European Union from both sides, I think primarily about Hungary and Serbia. So uh, China uh, was actually represented as a kind of savior and uh, I have to admit that I have family members who took the Chinese vaccine and regret it dearly now because it's not working. Uh, now we are facing the whole new problem uh, with the uh, efficiency or the lack of the efficiency of the vaccines. But uh, this, is, this is just a very not publicly addressed issue. What we focus on is a political issue and I, I think that that is highly problematic because uh, when it comes to at least this vaccine business uh, in, in Europe, uh, don't forget it, it was never directly uh, done from China to the Central and Eastern Europe, but there was this uh, Saudi Arabia as a kind of space when the deals were made. So uh, the, what I want to say, the situation is much more complicated that, than, 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 than we can trace at this moment. So uh, I would really love to hear uh, from the position of Taiwan and from, the, the, uh, from your uh, research areas, how do you see this politicization of uh, obtaining the vaccine on the one hand and um, maybe Something that I would love to, to hear much more about is uh, the accomplishment of the local uh, medical scientists when it comes to the local Taiwanese vaccines. So, uh, as I said, I really uh, appreciate, more than appreciate, what, what the Taiwanese uh, uh, government, uh, NGOs, uh, scientists in, in all areas are managing to do in this kind of a limited situation and space given. So uh, what we can hear uh, uh, at the moment is that there are two vaccines, two local vaccines, that they are uh, at the stage two of the human testings, but uh, we also can see that there are some uh, dilemmas related to it. And I would really like to, 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 to hear from both of you 
uh, what do you know? What you can tell us about uh, how this vaccine is emerging? Do they uh, do the Taiwanese scientists do it independently, or there are some kind of collaborations with the regional and international scientists, with or without uh, membership in the international uh, health organizations? So this is the question for both of you. Uh, then for Jonathan, uh, I would also just uh, build on or continue with the Nicholas. A question. So yes, we, we before we started, we, we talked about this uh, fake news and uh, misinformation and uh, huge investments uh, by the Chinese uh, actors. Let's put it in that way to uh, to create the image that Taiwan is utterly failing, utterly failing. Of course, we know that that is not true. Uh, what I would want to hear more uh, from Jonathan, especially because you mentioned this, uh, all our eyes are on Taiwan for good and not so good reasons, if I uh, paraphrase it correctly. Uh, I am especially interested to hear uh, how do you observe uh, it seems to be more frequent and uh, more common way of uh, English language media reporting on Taiwan recently that emphasize the risk, the danger, uh, the war coming on Taiwan. Um, how do you see this uh, media engagement and uh, uh, intended or not intended uh, heightened attention when it comes to the visions of Taiwan's future. Who can benefit from this increased attention uh, in our understanding of what is uh, Taiwan facing in the near or not so near future? Uh, and for Harry, I just want, uh, I, I, I was, uh, I, I found it very, very interesting uh, how you noticed when you listed the names of the pandemics and uh, how you noticed that uh, it was not the problem to call it Hong Kong flu or the Asian flu. And we know very, very well how, you, again, huge politicization and huge investment, not only from China to say, no, 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 don't, you should never, never call it uh, Wuhan virus or China virus, but we also know, especially Trump's administration, it was uh, uh, almost uh, the way to showcase your relation to China. Are you, uh, in the, as a part of the US uh, government or uh, apparatus, are you going to use the word Wuhan virus or Chinese virus or COVID? So uh, how do you see? Uh, uh, if you could comment more on this uh, political, uh, uh, very, very historically new politicization, uh, would you interpret it as a kind of a continuation or the wish, uh, uh, not only of the West to uh, somehow put it, you know, the disease is somewhere else, uh, the, the epidemics is somewhere else, uh, uh, immediately we connected with scientific and hygienic modernity, you know, these areas, their hygiene, this is, this is not modern. These are really the discourses uh, coming uh, over and over from the pre-modern times, the image of Asia as the core of uh, the disease, uh, unhygienic, uh, everything basically. <laughs> so I would uh, really love to hear. Do you do you see this uh, at the investment from the Western side as a you know how does it figure in to this uh, discourse of hygienic modernity and the lack of hygienic modernity? And uh, can you see anything uh, else than uh, again a signpost of China's? new power, a new phase of repositioning in the modern world order, if we want to use that word, in saying, no, we understand the, word, the, the power of words and we are not going to allow you to do, to do this in this way. We have the nationalist rhetorics in the background, we have the powerful, empowering and powerful uh, Chinese governmental uh, rhetorics behind it. So I would really love to hear what you think about this naming, the, the, the investment in naming and what can you read from that. Thank you all so much and uh, I, I really, really hope that this will not be the final uh, conversation that we will have on, on, on these issues. Thank you. So in fact, I think now our two discussions pose a, a number of questions. I can summarize it. I think there's, there are some commonalities between them. So interest in the issue of politicalization of the vaccine, disinformation. Um, of course, there are also more specific questions about the to local, uh, locally produced Taiwanese vaccine and how we can you know, kind of help Taiwan 
to have a meaningful participation in the WHO. So we have some kind of coalition. So a, a variety of questions. And I think what I would do is I would just ask Jenison and then uh, Harry to respond, but you can select the ones that you feel that you can immediately respond. So don't worry if you cannot answer all of them. I, I do understand there is a time pressure. So Jenison, are you there? <laughs> Hello, yes, I'm here. <laughs> um, thank you um, to Nicholas and to um, Jessica. I mean, these are fantastic questions. <laughs> uh, I, I'd like to uh, have 24 hours and get back to you. That would be the ideal situation. But um, let, let me try and respond um, uh, on the hoof, as it were. So, I mean, first of all, um, about Nicholas's question about disinformation and cognitive warfare and how this has been marshaled um, around uh, the COVID issue. So, I mean, the first thing that I would say about this is that Taiwanese uh, information consumers are completely uh, used to information warfare, disinformation, misinformation coming from uh, the other side. I mean, this is uh, not something that they are unaccustomed to. Um, and I would suggest that in the main, Taiwanese, the majority of Taiwanese information consumers are pretty sophisticated and clued up uh, about what's going on. On the other hand, uh, of course, there are always, um, you know, less sophisticated uh, information consumers, uh, and particularly where you know, the misinformation feeds into their pre-existing political biases or whatever, um, you know, this is, uh, you know, this can be an effective uh, means of uh, influence activity. Um, I mean, I guess, you know, um, you know, yesterday I was, um, I was looking at some um, Chinese misinformation uh, that was going around in Taiwan and I was just struck by just how low quality it was. Just, you know, uh, it was written in simplified characters using mainland uh, Chinese linguistic conventions, uh, talking about, you know, bodies piling up in rivers that people could just go and check if they wanted to. Uh, and all the rivers have dried up in Taiwan at the moment anyway. So, um, you know, just completely uh, ludicrous um, stuff. I personally, I don't think that that kind of, um, that kind of misinformation is, is really um, effective. I mean, what I would point to as being more pernicious um, is the, the misinformation that uses actors, you know, that co-ops actors on the ground in Taiwan, whether through uh, financial incentives or through um, political uh, affinities um, and through media operations and, you know, exerting uh, its influence on, you know, this more uh, institutionalized actors. I personally, I think that's um, more effective than, you know, these, these really uh, crude grassroots type um, activities. Um, so, you know, the question of whether it's been effective or not, um, I mean, you know, the jury is out. We, we don't have um, studies on the effectiveness of it or not. I mean, I would say that, um, Taiwanese people uh, do not want anything to do with the Chinese vaccine. <laughs> um, I don't think you really needed a, um, you know, you didn't really need much of a reason to, to have that kind of opinion. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a low trust towards the Chinese vaccine uh, wherever you are in, in most places in the world. Um, and certainly because uh, Taiwan hasn't had the urgency of high case lows, large number of deaths, uh, that would inspire people to want to take any vaccine. Uh, and I can just um, address Nicholas's point about, uh, about that. Um, as So the original figure of 40% uh, concords with what I've seen as well. Um, that number has gone up as the outbreak has kind of erupted. Um, so I think that probably confirms, you know, a natural um, uh, human tendency, you know, when everything is good, um, you, you think about things in one way, and when things start going bad, you, you think you reconsider. Um, so that attitude towards vaccination uh, is improving. Um, the one thing that is lacking in Taiwan at the moment, uh, has been lacking in Taiwan, is uh, a political uh, communications and mobilization campaign around vaccinations. And again, the incentive structure hasn't been there because 
um, you know, Taiwan has been so successful, it's had such low, low case loads and fatalities. Um, I think that that um, mobilization effort to, um, to encourage people to get vaccinated, I think that is coming. Um, I think there is, you know, I know there is an awareness in the administration that um, the way out of um, the, the, the pandemic is through vaccination, that, that Taiwan's victory was kind of a, um, you know, was a, was a false victory. It was a temporary victory and it's been proven um, as such. Um, the question about, uh, I think you put it in this, in this way, Nicholas, um, is the, the WHO um, a, a Chinese lapdog? Um, I would, <laughs> my, my answer would be, um, I, I would I would put that language in in, in a slightly different way, um, but I think that you know um, the investigation into the um, coronavirus origins that the uh, WHO carried out in China did not inspire a lot of confidence in their independence and neutrality. Um, I think that you can see in the uh, WHO some of the uh, signs of the, the, the Chinese modus operandi, um, which is, you know, to, uh, you know, to seek a, a stronger voice in multilateral institutions through funding, through placing Chinese officials in, in positions of power, um, through cultivating support from uh, member nations. Uh, I think you can certainly see that in the, w, uh, the WHO as you can in other or many other organizations um, as well. Um, Sorry, I'm, I'm sure I've, I've missed something, but um, let me uh, address um, Jessica's point. Um, so the uh, politicization of vaccine in Taiwan, I mean, everything in Taiwan is politicized. Anything that's got anything to do with China is politicized. So I think <laughs> that it's, it's a natural consequence of, you know, that's just the way it is. Um, is China making life complicated for Taiwan in terms of acquiring vaccine? Uh, China says no, Taiwan says yes, and there's a, a whole, you know, massive noise around, uh, around that issue. So, you know, at face value, one would uh, probably be more likely to, um, to lean towards the Taiwanese explanation than the PRC's explanation, um, but, but I don't have um, any evidence either way. Um, certainly, you know, within Taiwan itself, there are conspiracy theories about the Chinese vaccine, um, that China would poison, uh, mass poison uh, the Taiwanese population, uh, that it would put something, uh, put something in the, in the vaccine that would make Taiwanese people, um, you know, uh, more, um, to more welcome uh, unification or whatever. I mean, these are crazy conspiracy theories. I don't think we need to put any store by them whatsoever. However, they, they do have some currency uh, in Taiwan. Um, I mean, ultimately, you know, at the end of the day, uh, China would be absolutely delighted. It would be a, a, an, a, an incredible victory for them um, if Taiwan was to take Chinese vaccine and if China could portray itself as uh, ending the pandemic and saving Taiwan. I mean, that would just be a propaganda victory uh, of all time, right? Um, Taiwan, you know, is, is, has no interest in Chinese vaccine whatsoever, um, so that's not going to happen. Um, they've um, secured 5 million doses through COVAX, um, they've got 5 million doses of Moderna on, on order. Um, the snobbery that I was talking about, um, Nicholas, was to do with um, the AZ, uh, AstraZeneca um, vaccine, which I took and was perfectly fine, by the way. Uh, that's the... the, the um, uh, the vaccine that we mostly have in the UK, and it was perfectly fine. There's some snobbery around that, and I think that, um, again, there needs to be a, a political communication effort to address those concerns, um, and I think you will see that ramping up um, in the very near future. Uh, on the question of Taiwan's own vaccine, um, there are a couple of candidates uh, which are in um, stage two clinical trials at the moment. They're hoping to get um, emergency use authorization next month um, and hopefully if that goes um, through then they'll be able to um, get that vaccine to, to market by uh, maybe July, probably August. 
Um, these are Taiwanese companies that have been organically, uh, independently um, developed um, in Taiwan, but Taiwan's um, pharmacy medical industry is, is very good. Taiwan has great scientists, they have um, you know, great universities, great university hospitals. Um, so this is, this is not um, particularly surprising. In the meantime, they will be relying on sourcing um, vaccine from outside, uh, and there are doses on the way. Um, and finally, Jessica, the, the question about the, me the Western media framing of Taiwan, I mean, this is actually my expert area, one of my expert areas, so uh, I'm glad that you asked me this. Um, the other stuff, I'm just a complete amateur, but this is actually something I can speak to. Um, so, I mean, over a, a very long period of time, uh, the Western media framing of Taiwan has been <laughs> horrendous. Uh, <laughs> It's, uh, you know, it's all about tensions um, and it's all about, you know, Taiwan, <clears throat> you know, uh, provoking China, provoking instability, um, Taiwan as a source of conflict, a flashpoint, um, you know, Taiwan has no agency uh, except as a kind of object uh, between the US and China uh, and, and, you know, just the framing of Taiwan. Um, over the last 30 years, and I have a big um, empirical study of this, uh, is just diabolical. Um, <laughs> in the last few years, as the number of um, uh, correspondents have moved out of China into Taiwan, um, the coverage has improved. Um, I mean, I know that in the last couple of weeks, the coverage has had a blip. So first we had that Economist magazine uh, cover story um, yes, calling Taiwan. I was referring to yes. Yeah, um, yeah, calling Taiwan the uh, the most dangerous place on earth. Um, <laughs> uh, which I mean, actually, I mean the the articles itself, themselves um, in that special issue actually were pretty balanced, and they they made a fair you know a fair assessment of. Um, you know, the difficulty that Taiwan has finding itself as a kind of, um, you know, in, in the middle of a deteriorating uh, US-China relationship, and this is not a good place to be. Um, that's true, and, you know, there, there is a possibility, particularly when we see all these flyovers and sail-throughs and stuff, there is a possibility that there's going to be an accident, a miscalculation, um, which could easily, um, you know, spiral, escalate into a militarized conflict. Um, and, you know, you can imagine that um, very easily, right? So I don't think, you know, the underlying message of, of, of those pieces was, um, was not particularly off base, but the framing of it as the most dangerous place in the world was just, you know, was just, <laughs> uh, was heartbreaking as, you know, somebody who studied Taiwan for 25 years, uh, and, and fought against this framing of Taiwan for 25 years. To see that in one of the most um, famous magazines in the world was, was really heartbreaking. Um, and, um, you know, the other, the other way that there's been a blip is that, you know, uh, the story about Taiwan for the last year, uh, about its successes, about normality, uh, has got boring for those people who are covering it. And the media likes change. It likes new stories. It doesn't want to report the same old, same old stuff all the time. And so um, the fact that the, the situation has completely changed in Taiwan, um, you know, it gives them something to, to focus on that is, that is different. Um, I don't think that they've done a great job in um, contextualizing the outbreak um, or, you know, <laughs> or, or, or really just, you know, uh, reiterating the point that Taiwan's outbreak, and I'm not diminishing the fear and anxieties that people in Taiwan are facing, I'm not, I'm not diminishing that at all, but Taiwan's outbreak is absolutely tiny and minuscule. I mean, we have, uh, we have more cases and more deaths in my city, in my small provincial city than, than Taiwan did uh, yesterday. So, you know, it's, it's not... Um, it, it, it's on the, in the grand scheme of things, uh, Taiwan's outbreak is, is pretty small. Um, I've got, you know, every confidence that they will get on top of it. Um, you know, they're still able to trace way over 50% of cases. Uh, yes, they lost the thread for a time. Yes, they've got community spread. But, you know, the one thing about Taiwanese people um, is that, um, you know, they're disciplined. 
uh, they are, you know, habitual mask wearers, social distancing, uh, you know, those kind of things are not problems. Um, you're not going to have um, anti-lockdown demonstrations like we had. You're not going to have those crazy um, uh, libertarians um, uh, around town that, that we have. Um, so I don't think it's going to be a, a huge issue to get on top of that. Um, you know, going forward, I would suspect that all of those foreign correspondents located in Taiwan will be a benefit to Taiwan. Um, the thing in terms of media coverage that Taiwan has um, lacked is um, just a, you know, a focus on non-conflict stories, taking Taiwan out of, uh, out of cross-strait relations, out of tensions, out of US-China conflict, um, and focusing on, you know, the things that um, you know, make Taiwan um, so valuable, you know, um, its values, its increasingly progressive society, um, and the human aspects of, um, of, you know, a place that is not just a pawn in uh, a battle between two superpowers. And I think that, you know, over the last year, you can really see that kind of nuance and that texture coming through um, in a lot of stories. So I'm actually optimistic. Having studied this for 20 years, I am optimistic um, that it will get better. Um, I'm not happy about the last two weeks, but, <laughs> you know, it, I, 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 I consider that a blip. So I'll stop there. Thank you for those, two, uh, those questions. I mean, those questions really were um, fantastic. And um, I'm sorry, I haven't done justice to them in my answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jennison. You're too humble. <laughs> yeah. How about Harry? Are you there? Okay. Th yes, I am. And uh, actually, thank you, Nicholas. Thank you, Jessica, for your wonderful questions. There are a lot to uh, think about, a lot to go through, a lot to ruminate. But I think I'll just respond to those I can. And then uh, there are just several simple points. Right. First of all, it's uh, about uh, failure. Actually, it's quite interesting. I just left. I just left Hong Kong, the forefront of the new Cold War, so-called, right? And then it's quite interesting to see that uh, on the first day of the COVID surge, 200 and something cases in Taiwan, that it immediately see that the state-sponsored tabloid newspapers, uh, uh, One Way Bo, Wen Hui Bao, and Da Gong Bao, Da Gong Bao. Right. They immediately published about, okay, this is the, this is a result of Taiwanese fail, uh, the, the government, Taiwanese government's failure. Right. So it takes the first, the very immediate step to, to define uh, what's going on in, in Taiwan. Actually, Taiwan, uh, including, including the government, including its citizens, are also still learning because this is a completely new experience for them. They haven't really experienced a, a, a a lockdown and, and everything is, is new. We are too early to say whether or not this is a, uh, we can contain the virus or not, right? And I'm not an optimistic person either, right? Uh, because I think the vaccine is quite critical in, in terms of uh, how successful that we can contain the virus here. And then vaccine hesitancy, but I don't. I also do not think that uh, this is vaccine hesitancy can be really extent, uh, very heavily shaped by China's uh, uh, dis, uh, cognitive disinformation campaign, because it's a very complex issue. Right? Even I think scientists do not understand enough um, the vaccine hesitancy. For example, like uh, when I'm in, in, in Hong Kong, I've been trying to really understand to uh, parents why they still firmly believe that autistic, uh, their uh, autistic children's condition were caused by MMR vaccine, even if these parents were highly educated, even if the information has been um, uh, disproved by pop journals. And then uh, there, the, the, I, actually, I think that the, the problem is very, very complex. And then we can't, we, we have to, we, we can't forget that Taiwan is a highly politicized and also split society, right? So we have pan green, pan green and pan blue, uh, camps in, in Taiwan. And this at this moment, we can see a lot of uh, vaccine issues. This has been taken up by, by people of different political ideologies to lash out their discontent about, um, uh, about the government, local and or central, right? So yeah, this is a reality test for Taiwan just now. 
Um, uh, and the uh, how successful will uh, uh, the local vaccine, Taiwan's local vaccine, will, will become? Actually, we don't know. But actually, this is uh, we know that Taiwan uh, got. I mean, scientists stumbled a lot. Not only because, well, I mean, the major. I would say that the the main uh, reason was that Taiwan is excluded from the WHO, right? So that the information is not really widely shared. Taiwan had to, in order to to develop a vaccine, you need patients, you need virus strains, right? You need all this information, and Taiwan had difficulty accessing this information at the very beginning, and then also. Uh, if you want to enter the third phase, which is clinical uh, random trial, you need a large amount of people, uh, volunteers. And then for, for example, for, uh, for you, you say, say uh, for Moderna, for Pfizer, what uh, where do they test their, uh, their vaccines? In developing, underdeveloped countries, in Brazil, and, in, in, and even for, for China as well, they tested their, um, uh, their, their vaccines in these, these countries. And this is something you say something about that Taiwan, if Taiwan does not have political allies, or is Taiwan not part of the international organizations that back their scientific project, then it suffers, right? So uh, we actually don't know how successful the, the local vaccine will become, right? And also the naming politics, this is quite interesting. I, I, I think this is a not only, well, I would think there are two, uh, factors influencing the 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 the, uh, the naming of COVID nineteen, not just because the Ch China was uh, doing doing the spinning uh, during the pandemic. It was prior to this. This was some I can't remember the name of the of the of the epidemic in Africa somewhere. The naming of certain viral related uh, disease in a I think an African town that resulted in quite disastrous um, consequence because of the stigma that people carried. And then so that, uh, since that, I think this is uh, sometime post the year 2000, and the WHO came up with this policy, not, uh, that not really uh, name any uh, virus that appeared later than that with a particular particular name, but actually you can see that China does uh, have, a, have, a, have a huge voice in it. it when you compare it with people talking about African mutation, Indian mutation, right? And so this is, well, you can see that uh, there are a lot of people trying to, uh, trying to spin this. Now, um, how much will China's dogma continue to have an impact on this uh, global health matters then. I don't think this is a, a China's problem. Actually, as a historian, I, I would see that the, the bureaucracy of the WHO, the structural problem that needs to change, right? And let's think back to, uh, let's look at the uh, 1946, right? When, before WHO was established, actually the health organization of League of Nations was pretty much uh, Anglo-American, no, Anglo-European focus, right? And so actually these uh, international health matters did not even cross the Atlantic to the, uh, to the North America. There was a difficulty of integration between the Pan-American Health Organization and the League of Nations, right? And then it was whom who actually became outliers and then suggesting in, a, the, one of, in one of the UN seminars that we need a big overarching, a encompassing organization to govern uh, the health of all, you, all mankind. Then. Delegates from first Norway, second Brazil, third China, right? Xi Jinping, right? And then so this was, we, and Xi Jinping, this was a very interesting diplomat. He was a very young guy, only 30 something year old. And then, Actually, to, to do things, you do need outliers. So when now China, WHO has become such a huge, huge, huge machine, you need people to become movers and shakers. Perhaps you need to uh, propose alternative uh, ways to deal with uh, global health issues. And this is uh, uh, 
uh, something we have already seen a lot from 1970s, the emergence of, for example, like uh, Médecins Sans Frontières and yeah, okay, many others, right? So this is it, I, I, I perhaps will stop here. And then I hope that I answer most of the questions that I am able to, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And in fact, I have seen also in the chat there are at uh, least two questions and uh, please our participants, you can drop your questions in the chat box if you wish. The first question I pick up is from Natalie. Uh, she said China has donated or sold COVID-19 vaccines to African countries like Zimbabwe, making Zimbabwe one of the uh, most vaccinated nations. Would you know how this compares statistically to the contributions to, to Taiwanese vaccination efforts? Uh, uh, I guess perhaps the answer is quite simple because I think Taiwan hasn't taken any PRC uh, vaccine, but uh, our, our presenters can help me. And then the second question uh, from, uh, uh, okay, here is, could the presenters discuss how Taiwan WHO relations was during the Ma Injo administration and also the perception of Taiwan in the West during those years. So anybody from our Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Let, let me take let me take the first question and I'll leave the, the second one to, to Harry with, on which he's an expert. Um, so I'll just say, you know, <clears throat> regarding the Chinese vaccine, I mean I know that um there's a lot of uncertainty there's you know the the eff efficacy of the chinese vaccines um is pretty opaque we don't have a lot of data we don't have a lot of information about it at all um and that lack of transparency obviously leads to um a lot of skepticism uh in taiwan it's led to antipathy uh, but that's you know an effect of, of politics as well um but you know, at the end of the day, you know, I, you know, speaking up on, on China's behalf, I would say that, you know, their contribution to um, vaccination programs in the poorest countries of the world, the developing world, uh, is, um, you know, potentially extremely important. Um, I mean, if you look at the way that the rich countries have tended to hoard uh, vaccine, um, prioritizing, of course, you know, prioritizing their own populations first. Um, but then, you know, if you look at the predicted schedules of vaccination for the poorest countries in the world, those populations without a Chinese vaccine are not going to be protected until 2024 or 2025. And if we let the, uh, the epidemic continue in these places um, for that length of time, um, you know, the probability of more uh, variants coming out is 100%. And the probability of, you know, death on a massive scale um, in countries in Africa and elsewhere in the developing world is very high. And so, um, you know, personally, you know, looking at the contribution that, that China is making, I'm not saying China is an altruist, I'm not saying it's doing it out of the, uh, the good of its heart or that the CCP is um, you know, spreading love through vaccines across the world. Uh, of course, there, there are other uh, incentives at play here as well. But, um, you know, the Chinese contribution to vaccination um, globally, I think, is very important. If we want the, you know, the end point of this to be that the entire global population has protection against coronavirus, then it's not going to get there quickly enough without um, without China's efforts. And so, you know, accepting the skepticism, accepting the doubts about the Chinese vaccine, um, you know, I think that it's important to recognize that um, they are stepping up where the United States, the European Union, and uh, particularly the UK, which has been very stingy with its vaccine, um, <laughs> uh, have not. Um, so I've just add that point. Thank you. How about Harry? Okay, so two questions, right? I, I simply, about vaccine, uh, Chinese vaccine acceptance, uh, the acceptance of Chinese vaccine in Taiwan. It's, I think it's very straightforward. I le just left Hong Kong and in Taiwan, uh, no, I mean in Hong Kong, uh, there, there are options. Uh, there, there, there is this uh, Sinovac and uh, also uh, the BioNTech. 
produced by Germany. And then clearly that you can see that with an exhaustible amount of Sinovac vaccines in, in, in Hong Kong, people do not really prefer that one. Right, so now if you want to test that in Taiwan, what, what's, what, what is that going to happen? I think the answer is pretty straightforward. And then for, oh my God, I think I, I saw your familiar name, Kai Xu. I think we met in Oxford, right? Some, sometime, 10, more than 10 years ago. Now, this question, Taiwan's uh, WHO relationship to, during the Ma ying administration, a lot of people kind of praised that this was, this period was the, uh, that in Taiwan actually enjoyed the best relationship with the WHO, but we need to pay attention to a period prior to that which was after SARS, Taiwan was bound to uh, become part of the uh, international health regulation that was revised after SARS, right? So without that, Taiwan could not easily get access to the information about, um, about emergent uh, infectious diseases, right? So it was not only uh, during that period, Mindjo's period, Taiwan enjoyed a stronger bond with the WHO. It was actually prior to that, right? So it already occurred. So, uh, but actually the second, the, the perception, perception of Taiwan in the West during those years, this is a, a complex question. Taiwan has been regarded, uh, regarding itself as uh, a country that is modernized, that is quite advanced in, in terms of science and technology after the second World War, Taiwan has been self-fashioning as a country equivalent to a Western country, right? But actually how much Western or Westernized of, uh, uh, did, did Taiwan become? This is, a, I, I think, a, a question that, that, that is still left unanswered. And I'm, in, in a lot of my project, I'm still exploring it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see that Kai Shi, he later says he also wished to hear from Jenison. <laughs> so in addition to Harry's answer, Jenison helped. <laughs> uh, the perception of Taiwan in the West during Ma ying time. <laughs> Any comments? <laughs> I beg your pardon. That is a question that I can answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, uh, okay, yeah, I mean, um, the... Um, I mean, I can tell you um, from the research, the, the empirical research that I've done um, on um, not just uh, in the media, but also among elites uh, who, I've, uh, who I've interviewed and looking at um, public opinion um, data, which is very patchy uh, about attitudes towards Taiwan, but nevertheless, you know, helps round out that picture. Um, Taiwan, uh, at least until um, the, uh, the Sunflower Movement. Uh, Taiwan during the first uh, six years of the Maing Zhou era was, um, was framed in a completely opposite way than Taiwan under Chen Shui-bian. Uh, under Chen, it was, um, you know, irresponsible, um, you know, causing problems, rocking the boat, uh, these are all the, you know, the, the, um, the cliches that we use. Uh, it was in, you know, uh, creating tensions. It was causing a problem for the United States. Uh, it was um, you know, undermining the status quo. So a lot of that framing was, you know, was very similar um, to the PRC's own framing of, uh, of Taiwan at the time. Um, and the Ma, it was completely different. Um, I mean, for one thing, you know, Ma was, you know, love him or hate him, you know, he was very urbane, he spoke great English, which Chen did not, uh, he spoke great Chinese, which Chen did not, um, he is, you know, this very cultivated, educated, um, sophisticated political communicator, um, you know, with, a, you know, an educational background at Harvard, blah, 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 right? Um, and he was able to present as a responsible stakeholder. Um, and that reinforced what he was doing through policy um, in cross-strait relations. Um, so, you know, basically the rest of the world, until, until very recently, the rest of the world just wanted an excuse to ignore Taiwan. Um, they wanted, uh, they, 
they, they just wanted, um, you know, peaceful and productive relations between Taiwan and China that would allow them never to think about Taiwan again. Um, and, you know, the, uh, the suite of um, rapprochement um, policies that were enacted under Ma, the embrace of 1992 consensus, which is a conceit, but it's a very useful one, um, allowed um, you know, um, the kind of relationship um, between the two sides that the rest of the world is very comfortable with. Not unification, not tensions, not war, and also not unification either. Um, and so, you know, uh, the way that, that Taiwan was framed under Ma um, really was very positive, responsible stakeholder, um, you know, uh, in that way. Some, you know, obviously the Sunflower Occupation of Parliament um, changed that, and a lot of the dissatisfaction with Ma, which had been rumbling for ages before that, but hadn't really been picked up on in the Western media, um, you know, suddenly was front page news. Um, and it, it, it really, you know, started, um, you know, people questioning um, whether the way that they had portrayed um, uh, detente policies um, was accurate or not. And suddenly people came to the realization that, you know, the detente between uh, the two sides um, didn't have, suddenly the way it was, was moving uh, so quickly uh, was not something that enjoyed widespread support in Taiwan, or there was a possibility that there was, um, you know, there was um, uh, distrust and anger at the moves that, uh, or the trajectory that relations were going in. Um, and since that time, you know, um, Taiwan's public external communications and the Thai uh, administration has been so savvy and effective at this, um, framing Taiwan as a status quo power, uh, framing uh, the PRC as the actor that wants to, um, uh, wants to change the status quo, uh, positioning Taiwan among uh, all, of the, all of those other uh, liberal democracies um, uh, and kind of tapping into the new understanding that many countries have of the reality of dealing with China. Um, I think that has, you know, uh, has been really effective and has changed the way that, that Taiwan is now framed. Um, in the last few years, I have seen Taiwan described as a country, as a nation, uh, more times than in the previous 30 years. Um, I've seen you know, a focus on um, you know, uh, Taiwanese um, social values and you know, the progressive elements of Taiwanese society uh, more than ever before. Um, and you know, it's much more likely now that you will see um, articles um, not with that uh, caveat about uh, renegade province, but uh, a self-ruled nation that is under uh, under pressure from um, you know uh, the other side that wants to annex uh, Taiwan and wants to um, prevent them for from you know fulfilling their democratic destiny. Um, and so, yeah, I mean the, the the framing over time has really changed. It's changed because of things that have happened in Taiwan. It's changed because of things that have happened in China, uh, and it's changed because of our more intense relationship uh, with the PRC and the and the recognition now that um, a lot of what is happening in our relationships with China have already been prefigured and all have already been happening with China's relationship with Taiwan um, for many years. Uh, and so, you know, I think that, yeah, it, it, it's really quite different now. Thank you. Um, in fact, time is running out, but I see there are two questions. One is from Dusika. Perhaps I let Dusika go first. And then the second one is actually from um, Simona. I think it would be better if Simona can just uh, turn on the mic and speak. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, so first Dusika and then Simona. How about that? Okay, Dusika, go ahead. Dusika, can I hear you? Can I hear you? Okay. Um, how about then, because um, we are running out of time. Uh, Simona, could you go first? Sorry about this. <laughs> 
No problem. Hi, everybody. Actually, I think Jonathan has partly already answered. The question was exactly what he just addressed whether he thinks that the kind of negative commentary that China has be, been receiving in the past few years can actually sort of like be, uh, well, exploited in a positive way by Taiwan to gain invisibility. But I think that's what he answered in the end, right? The situation is complex and there's variety. So I don't know if he wants to say something else that the way I phrased it was, given the more negative publicity and commentary surrounding China's influence and role in the multilateral order over the past few years, and China more assertive behavior towards the West, do you see this as an opportunity for Taiwan to gain in positive visibility and uh, sort of like stage itself as a responsible stakeholder? I, 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 I guess uh, he, Jonathan has already answered. I don't know if, uh, if they both have something more to say. Um, the only thing I'd like to say uh, is good morning, Savannah. It's nice to see you. How good morning. You Hi. <laughs> I can't wait to come to Zurich and see you in person again. Me too, <laughs> to invite you all. <laughs> And welcome to Nottingham as well, whenever we come out of lockdown. Um, no, I, I think, you know, you, you've, you've said it right there. Um, you know, I think that um, it, it is, you know, I hate to put it in these kind of instrumental terms, but it is to Taiwan's benefit um, that increasingly the rest of the world is recognizing how difficult a partner China can be. <laughs> And I think, you know, raising the salience of Taiwan's experience and, you know, just allowing us uh, to empathize and understand uh, Taiwan's situation. I think that's something that has been absolutely lacking. Um, and that's one of the contributing factors, I think, to uh, the way that Taiwan has been portrayed for all these years is that we just simply didn't have a way of empathizing with what's going on in Taiwan. Um, and I think now, you know, especially, you know, places like Australia, um, which are really having a difficult time in their relationship with China, um, you know, I think that, you know, they are really starting to open their eyes. I mean, unfortunately, you know, in some places like Australia, uh, that realization um, has kind of, um, you know, taken on a very dark and nasty um, aspect in anti-Chinese racism. And we see this also in, in the United States, um, you know, and that's, you know, something I think we're going to have to grapple with in our countries is how do we, how do we, you know, honestly face up to the difficulties of our relationship with China at the same time as, um, you know, differentiating that critique from critique of Chinese people or Asian people that might inspire racists to uh you know kind of manifest their beliefs and 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 start attacking people or being you know um prejudiced to people uh that i think is a is a coming very big issue for us it's starting in the us and, and, and in australia um and it will come to us i think uh certainly in the uk i don't know about switzerland but certainly in the uk we're already seeing these kind of these kind of seeds of uh um coming up as well um but anyway um just nice to see you um uh, simona <laughs>